Okay, I guess we'll get started for the morning. Um, thank you for coming at 7.15. Uh, I'm David Mount, I'm the clinical chief at the Brigham. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator for this morning, uh, and I'm gonna be giving two of your formal talks and then uh, a, a set of cases from the Brigham uh, later today. So first off, we'll, I'm gonna be talking about sodium disorders this morning. I don't really have any relevant disclosures for this subject. Uh, except for up to date, where I'm uh, one of the content editors for this area. Just to give an overview of uh, sodium disorders, first of all, of course, we'll, the bulk of this talk will be on hyponatremia. We have some cases that will help flesh out some of the uh, finer points of this uh, hyponatremia and hypernatremia when I give the renal grand rounds cases later on today. We'll talk about the pathophysiology, some of the things that I think are particularly impro important the diagnostic approach, clinical sequelae, and, and remembering that there's both acute hyponatremia and chronic hyponatremia and management issues. For hypernatremia and polyuria, we'll talk about the differential diagnosis and the diagnostic approach and management. So we have quite a lot to go over. I love this particular cultural quote. I think uh, there is a blog on precious bodily fluids uh, from Dr. Strangelove, of course, that water is the source of life, and as human beings, 70% uh, of you is water, and you and I need fresh, pure water, uh, water to replenish our precious bodily fluids. The point here is to remind us that hypo the hyper and hyponatremia are, for the most part, disorders of water metabolism, not of sodium metabolism, although there are, of course, indirect effects. It's important to go through the basic uh, physiology of vasopressin and thirst, and that is as you increase plasma osmolality, uh, thirst increases at the same, over the same period, over the same uh, uh, range in osmolality as does vasopressin. You're taught in textbooks that it's shifted to the right a little bit, but actually it's not. Um, and in the setting of water deficit, as plasma osmolality increases, plasma vasopressin or ADH rises, that reduces renal water excretion and normalizes osmolality. When you have a water excess, you reduce osmolality, plasma vasopressin declines, and renal water excretion increases. The renal response to vasopressin in, uh, in, in water conservation is quite complex, and it involves every component, really, of the renal tubular architecture in addition to the uh, vasa recta that encircle the tubules. And you end up with, at the collecting duct, uh, in antidiuretic states of uh, osmolality of 290, and in water-deprived states, uh, states 100, and that separates down as you reabsorb water to in antidiuretic states as much of as, uh, an osmolality of as much as 1150, and in water um, diuresis down to, to 65. And just to remember that the counter current mechanism, which we won't go through in detail, generates this uh, gradient in interstitial osmolality between the cortex and the inner medulla, where you have a tremendously concentrated interstitium that pulls water through uh, the collecting duct and water channels into the interstitium. I find it much easier to think about this, the countercurrent mechanism on molecular terms as you go along the nephron. And we have the benefit of uh, Mendelian disorders where these pathways are disrupted or of knockout mice where these pathways have been disrupted and we've learned a lot about the physiology. So the quintessential water channel, the first water channel is aquaporin 1. It's expressed at both membranes in the proximal tubule and it's a big component of water reabsorption, bulk water reabsorption in the proximal tubule. In the descending thin limb though, it's also in both membranes and it's also in the vasa recta. It plays a big role in water exit from the tubule that generates a lumen, a high lumen sodium chloride concentration. That then drives paracellular uh, sodium transport and transcellular chloride transport that's passive in the ascending thin limb. And this is dependent on the chloride channel CLCK1. 
So if you knock out acroporin-1 in mice, they develop a tremendous uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and water diuresis. The same goes for the chloride channel CLCK1. They have a tremendous uh, nephrogenic DI. There's a story about this with the acroporin-1 channel. When it was cloned, it was found to be in red cells, and it's a transfusion antigen that's missing in some people. When they looked at these people, they seemed phenotypically normal. However, when the mouse phenotype came along, they said, I wonder if these people have a concentrating defect. And so, lo and behold, these patients never go far from a big gallon of water uh, because they have a, a congenital significant nephrogenic DI. In the thick ascending limb, the NAKCL cotransporter separates electrolytes from water. This is a water impermeable segment of the nephron. That's the first effect in the countercurrent multiplier and plays a big role in renal concentration. Clinically, this is important because if you give furosemide, you can inhibit that and inhibit the countercurrent mechanism, and that's one of the mechanisms that we use to treat SIDH. Then when we get to the collecting duct, urea transport through uh, the vasopressin-sensitive urea transporters plays a big role in the concentrating mechanism, but in particular, it plays a big role in, this, in reabsorbing urea in states of high protein intake, when, whereas, where that may actually have a, uh, cause problems with the countercurrent mechanism. And then we have at the apical and basolateral uh, membrane, the acroporin uh, channels in the collecting duct that play a big role in water absorption. We can then sort of narrow in on the final common pathway of most uh, forms of hyper and hyponatremia, which is the principal cell. And under the influence of vasopressin, you activate the V2 receptor that activates adenylate cyclase that phosphorylates the acroporin 2 channel and forces it to shuttle back and forth into the apical membrane. That then, in the context of this big osmolar gradient, drives water absorption through the, the principal cell. And if you look really carefully, in most cases of hyponatremia, there's some exaggerated activity of this mechanism. And in many cases of hypernatremia and nephrogenic di diabetes insipidus, there's an in, in this mechanism is inactive in some way. The other really important concept that I stole from a, a, a table from many years ago from one of Bud Rose's textbooks is this concept of uh, osmolality versus volume regulation or the effect of circulating volume, what we now call often, I should update this table, the arterial perfusion pressure. So there are two things, osmoregulation and volume regulation. What we're sensing is different. Here we sense plasma osmolality or tonicity. Here we sense uh, arterial perfusion pressure. This happens through hypothalamic osmoreceptors. This happens through baroreceptors in many localizations in the body. Here the effectors are vasopressin and thirst. Here the effectors are the sympathetic nervous system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, ANP and BNP that are negatively regulated in salt balance, uh, and vasopressin. So this issue where vasopressin plays a role in the defense of arterial circulation is where a lot of the physiological confusion comes in. Uh, it plays a role in, in preserving blood pressure and preserving perfusion, uh, but that is separate really from the water homeostasis to some degree, and that's where you get this crosstalk between actual sodium disorders and water disorders. In the end then, the, what we're affecting here is urine osmolality and water intake. What we're affecting here is urinary sodium excretion, but also vascular tone in the defense of extracellular volume or arterial perfusion pressure. Concomitant with this, there are three different subtypes of vasopressin receptors. You don't need to remember them all. Uh, there are really two that are critical for our purposes. The V1A receptor, which is expressed many uh, cells in the body, but particularly in, in blood vessels and in the heart. It plays a role in constricting blood vessels. It also plays a role in baroreflex blood pressure control. And it also plays a role, interestingly, in the hypertrophic response of the heart, say in response to banding. The V2 receptor is expressed in those renal principal cells that we talked about. We don't talk about this much in physiology, but it's also expressed in the thick ascending limb. 
and it plays a big role in activating the, the countercurrent mechanism and setting up that osmolar gradient that's important for water absorption. We also don't talk about the fact that the V2 receptor also activates salt absorption. So it activates the NAK cell co-transporter in the thick limb. It activates the epithelial sodium channel in principal cells. So it does have significant effects on, on sodium absorption, and that's part of its action as well. The other important issue I find when we talk about hyponatremia in particular is this is largely a disorder of this central nervous system. And it's a disorder of the hypothalamic osmoreception that drives vasopressin secretion and, and thirst. So we need to go into a little bit of the neuroanatomy. The osmoreceptors are in the organo, organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis. I put this here so that I remember exactly what it is. And the subfornical organ. There are osmoreceptors uh, all along this pathway. The cells that generate vasopressin and, and store it in, in the posterior pituitary, their cell bodies, their nuclei, are also osmoreceptive. And the, the physiology is you synthesize vasopressin in these uh, neurons, it then transports down to the posterior pituitary where it's stored, and then released in response to the os these osmotic or non-osmotic stimuli. That then circulates in the body and activates the countercurrent mechanism and reabsorption of water in the setting of uh, antidiuresis and, and generating a concentrated urine. The other important issue is that this relationship between changes in osmolality and vasopressin secretion is not static. It's constantly being regulated at, this, at the osmoreceptor neurons uh, by many different hormones and, and mediators. So if you think, for example, in salt balance, if you take subjects and salt load them, you can shift this osmolar response to the right. If you have patients that are sodium restricted and hypovolemic, you'll shift the, the, salt, the uh, osmolar uh, curve to the left. We often talk about turning on vasopressin recept receptors in the setting of hypotension. You really have to have frank shock to have that be the, the exclusive stimulus. What we see though, really I think a lot of the time at the bedside, when we think of hypovolemic patients, when we give them saline, we're shifting them from one uh, osmolar response curve to, to another. And when that happens, we shut off vasopressin and then the physiology changes dramatically. And this is a really key take-home point in hyponatremia. Again, the physiology is never static in these patients, or rarely static, once we start doing things to them. So the typical hyponatremic, hypovolemic hyponatremic patient, when we start giving them saline, we're gonna shut off vasopressin, and we can expect some sequelae from that in the way they respond. So thirst, it turns out, as I said in the textbooks, you'll learn that the, the response curve has shifted a little bit compared to vasopressin. But if you do very careful grading of thirst as osmolality increases, the response curve is actually identical. And many of the same osmoreceptive neurons that play a role in vasopressin secretion also play a role in thirst. The other take-home issue, of course, in hyponatremia is that you typically need intake of free water to generate hyponatremia. So there also has to be, if you think logically, some abnormality of thirst that accompanies many patients with, say, SIDH. And this, did, this paper didn't get a lot of attention, but I think it's really critical. This was a study of several patients with SIDH and when they looked at their thirst score in response to plasma osmolality, if this is the normal uh, thirst, uh, the normal response, it's shifted to the left, just as these vasopressin, uh, these patients have a, a vasopressin response curve that is also shifted to the left. So in SIDH, thirst is also inappropriately activated at lower osmolalities uh, and this, uh, along with vasopressin. When we think of the initial uh, evaluation of hyponatremia, first of all, we take a history and physical, of do, and do a physical, of course. 
Medications are key, and I know all of you, uh, when we get consults in the, in, in the hospitals, far and away probably the, mo the single most common cause of SIDH, I think, in this day and age that we see is SSRIs or related antidepressants. Past medical history is important. Is this a patient that's had prior pituitary surgery, for example, who is likely to have uh, problems with, with uh, vasopressin? Sorry, let me just shut this off. And then a review of symptoms, uh, symptoms attributable to acute or chronic hyponatremia, or symptoms that are suggestive of a cause, for example, profuse diarrhea, causing hypovolemic hyponatremia. You also really want to get some idea of how long the process that's associated with the hyponatremia has been going on. Is this an acute process uh, or is this a chronic process? And we'll show example of, of, an example of very clearly acute hyponatremia uh, in the cases that I'll go through later on. The physical exam is, is very important. Uh, is this patient hypovolemic? Uh, you know, very hard data really are, are they orthostatic? Do they have orthostatic changes in their heart rate and blood pressure? Do they have a, a lower than expected JVP? Uh, are they hypervolemic? Uh, do they have a raised JVP? Do they have peripheral edema? Do they have RALS on, on chest x-ray? However, a, a key uh, lesson is that the physical exam <coughs> is not always that helpful in determining if people actually have hypovolemic hyponatremia, and there's a classic paper that shows that. The initial lab evaluation is, is multifold. You need a plasma osmolality. It's absolutely imperative that you get a plasma osmolality in all cases that you see of hyponatremia. You can still get pseudohyponatremia due to uh, mostly high lipoproteins, for example, lipoprotein X. We've seen cases of that at the Brigham. Um, you also want to have a urine osmolality, and you want to have a urine sodium concentration at, at a minimum, plus I always also get a urine chloride, at least as well as potassium. If the urine sodium is less than 20, this suggests effective or true volume depletion. If it's greater than 20, this is a euvolemic cause of hyponatremia or uh, renal sodium wasting. So question number one. I know I was supposed to start with a question, but I think uh, it's helpful to sort of set them up a little bit. So this is a 63-year-old male relapsed alcoholic who drinks greater than 12 beers a day, so we think we know what's going on. He'd been to his primary care doctor two days before and was found to have a serum sodium of 115. This is actually a case from the Boston VA. He was told to return to the ED. Uh, on exam, he was barely rousable but responded slowly to commands. Uh, he was sort of uh, reverse orthostatic. He had hypertension when we stood him up um, but, and lower blood pressure supine. His serum sodium was less than 110. Uh, at the VA, for whatever reason, they don't go, go below 110. So I had to ask them to run the urine sodium, uh, the, run the serum sodium as a urine sodium where they don't do a dilution. And they were able to tell me that it was actually 106, if I recollect. Uh, he was clearly hypotonic uh, with a, a serum osm of 236, urine osm of 227, and a urine sodium less than 20. And I think you all can appreciate that this, this particular case was unusual. We were actually in the ICU seeing another patient where, and the medical resident said, oh, there's somebody down in the ED that just came in with a sodium less than 110. We usually get called 24 hours later when the data that you want doesn't get generated uh, during the patient's initial admission. But we were there right from the beginning in this particular case. So which of the following is the most likely cause of this presentation? Any takers? It's early in the morning. A little too, too early in the morning for beer potomania, but this is uh, the, the key, the key uh, uh, differential here. I put pure hypovolemic hyponatremia here because it's difficult in these patients to exclude bona fide hypovolemic hyponatremia. But I would uh, put to you that really the acute management of these patients with severe hyponatremia and a low urine sodium uh, 
is really not different. They both have the, the potential for rapid overcorrection of hyponatremia. And we'll go through why that in particular is, is important. I wanted to underline low solute hyponatremia just very briefly because this is really a very unique cause of hyponatremia in that in all likelihood vasopressin doesn't play a big role in generating hyponatremia in these patients. So these are patients with a history of alcohol dependence with suspicion of recent drinking, low urine osmols, rapid initial correction with IV normal saline, and they usually appear euvolemic, uh, but management would be similar for, as I said, for hypovolemic hyponatremia, where we would want to avoid or at least control the response to rapid uh, intravenous saline or rapid solute intake. So as I said, this is a vasopressin independent cause of hyponatremia. The way to think of this, uh, in my view, is that free water excretion in the urine always requires a minimum amount of solute. Beer provides carbohydrates that can sustain, uh, but it has no salt. It's something like one milliequivalent per liter of sodium, nor does it contain protein, so it generates a very minimal urinary solute excretion. When you combine that with the fact that beer is, doesn't have a very high uh, uh, alcohol content and tends to you know, promote a lot of free water intake, there's no vodka potomania by way of examples. Um, when you have this high free water intake, uh, patients become hyponatremic. And classically, we're taught that they will have very low urine sodiums and osms of about 100, but, that, but their urine sodiums and urine osms can be actually quite generous. And I would point to you to this case, a uh, very nice case review uh, of beer potomania. And they looked at all the urine osms, and very many of them actually were in the generous range. Very few of them were really where you'd think you would classically see them. So you need to be aware of the history uh, in, in a given patient. This particular patient I often will use as, an, uh, as, as, a, as a case description the entire uh, way. When he initially presented, he said he drank six beers a day. Once we corrected his sodium the next day a little bit, and he was a little bit more with it, he said it was 12. By the third day, he did admit that he drank 24 to 36 bottles of beer a day. So this was this gradual increase in the admitted amount of, of beer. So again, this issue of how do these patients develop hyponatremia, and it's really different from the typical vasopressin-driven hyponatremia. And if you look at the ability of free water clearance as a function of urinary osmolality and the responding your urine osmolality as a function of daily solute excretion, you'll see at higher osmoles per day, you have a much higher ability to, to uh, uh, free water clearance. And when you have very low uh, milliosms per day, your ability to excrete water is impaired. Again, this relates to the fact that you can't excrete a complete solute-free urine. Uh, that's the way I like to think of it. So in these patients, they may only be able to excrete uh, maybe a liter and a half a day of free water, but they're taking in three liters a day, and they end up being in a positive free water balance. The corollary to that is the minute you start to give them solute, they can then have this massive water diuresis. And so this is one of the classic causes of hyponatremia that can, quote, overcorrect very quickly. At any rate, further testing in hyponatremia that's important. Everybody does a TSH. I can't remember the last time I saw somebody with overt hypothyroidism who was hyponatremic, but clearly that does occur. A random cortisol is important to look for primary or secondary adrenal failure, and we'll talk about how uh, secondary adrenal failure is very similar to SIDH. Check other indices of pituitary function if you think this patient is hypopit. If you think the patient has primary adrenal failure, think of doing a, a, a cord stim test. A chest x-ray can be very important in the initial evaluation. You want to see in, in acute hyponatremia if they have pulmonary edema, and we'll go through that in a, in a few minutes. If you think, if this is a smoker that has SIDH, I think you're obligated to do a chest CT because you can often miss 
the central uh, findings of uh, small cell lung cancer. Remember, small cell is often much more central than other forms of lung cancer. It can be important in some patients to do a head CT uh, in the evaluation of SIDH. That's part of the sort of comprehensive evaluation. It's controversial whether you should do a head CT in the setting of acute hyponatremia, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But you also need to look at the sinuses and nasal cavity. Uh, we had a case a few years ago in a, in a pregnant woman who was hyponatremic uh, that, that we thought was from thiazides in pregnancy. Uh, she came back to clinic a few week, months later and she was still hyponatremic with SIDH and she had an olfactory neuroblastoma which is well described as a chronic cause of S SIDH. And that was found really just incidentally looking at the head CT and there was a mass in one of her sinuses. The diagnostic approach, of course, really hinges on the clinical history and the clinical exam. Uh, we think of patients being hypo, having hypovolemic hyponatremia, euvolemic hyponatremia, or hypervolemic hyponatremia. Here, total body sodium is down, total body water is increased to some degree in, in relationship to sodium. Here, total body sodium, really in SIDH, they're slightly volume expanded, to be honest, um, but their, their total body so sodium is around normal and their total body water in relation to sodium is increased. Here, total body sodium is increased and in relationship to that, also total body water is increased. And again, we, this assessment of volume status to look at whether they're euvolemic, hypo, euvolemic hypo, hypovolemic, or hypervolemic. And then the urine sodium is really key for the next step in the differential diagnosis. If they have a urine sodium less than 20, we think, think of some of these hypovolemic causes. If they're hypovolemic and they have a urine sodium greater than 20, we worry about renal salt loss. We worry about primary adrenal failure and hypoadrenal syndrome. If they're hypervolemic with a urine sodium greater than 20, that's usually in renal failure, whereas we'll see patients with urine sodiums less than 20 when they're hypervolemic, and those are patients that have decreased effective circulating volume or decreased arterial perfusion pressure because of these forms of, of uh, these disorders such as nephrotic syndrome, cirrhosis, or heart failure. So if we think of how, does, how do you defend circulatory uh, integrity with a reduction in cardiac output, it then follows how you develop hyponatremia in the setting of heart failure. If you have a hypovolemia or low output cardiac uh, failure or a decreased oncotic pressure and increased capillary permeability, cardiac output goes down, that activates ventricular and arterial receptors that activates the sympathetic nervous system, that activates the renin-angiotensin system, all those things in that table that we talked about. But there is also, I'm not sure I would call it non-osmotic vasopressin re uh, release, or really a shift in the response curve so that at a lower osmolality you're releasing os uh, 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 vasopressin. There is some data that the response curve in heart failure, for example, is normal but shifted to the left. In the setting of a high vasopressin level, you have an increase in systemic and renal vascular resistance that helps maintain circulatory integrity. As I mentioned, the V2 receptor activates sodium reabsorption as well as water reabsorption, so that helps with renal sodium retention, but the renal water retention is what gives us this hyponatremia in the setting of heart failure. Of course, the mechanism is, the, uh, the proximal mechanism is very different in cirrhosis and other forms of vasodilatory reductions in arterial perfusion pressure. And in that setting, however, you set up the same cascade and you have the same end result that you have an increase in vasopressin and an increase in water reabsorption. So I mentioned this issue that when you look at the uh, patient, a urine sodium less than 20 suggests hypovolemic hyponatremia or hypervolemic hyponatremia with heart failure. Uh, the question is where did this, uh, this cut point of, of 20 come from? There's a classic paper from Denver from many years ago that I talk to the fellows about all the time and I'll hand it to them because there's several lessons from this paper. 
One is that these are, were non edematous patients who were thought to be euvolemic by two physicians, uh, Dr. Robertson and Dr. Schreier. Dr. Uh, Schreier, of course, is one of the giants in clinical nephrology of the last century and this century. So these were pretty, pretty competent physicians that looked at these patients and thought they were euvolemic. They then gave them saline and they looked at the patients that had a correction in their serum sodium versus those that didn't seem to have a correction. The saline responders, <coughs> which we'll consider to be those that have physiology consistent with hypovolemic hyponatremia, they all had urine sodiums that were less than 20 on average. The average is about 18. So this is where this urine sodium of less than 20 comes from. So that's one take home message from, the, from this paper. The other take home message is that our physical exam is really not that helpful in differentiating hypovolemic hyponatremia from euvolemic hyponatremia. And it just goes to show how important it is to get that urine sodium and urine lights when you're examining, when you're evaluating these patients. The other corollary is some authors will say that you can't really say a patient has SIDH unless you cautiously give them some saline and see if the saline challenge also reduces their serum sodium. Many patients with SIDH, but usually the ones that have very, very, very uh, cranked up concentrating mechanisms, some of those patients will have a reduction in their serum sodium when you give them saline, but that's actually relatively rare, uh, although we're taught that it's not. Uh, so many other authors say that in addition to the typical criteria for SIDH, some saline challenge to make sure that there's not subclinical hypovolemia, hyponatremia is very important. Remember that in elderly patients or patients that have some degree of renal salt wasting, the urine sodium may, may not be as, a, as low as we expect, but it may be inappropriately low for that particular patient. We then get to the differential for SIDH that you are all very, very familiar with. In terms of malignancy, about 80% of the SIDH associated with malignancy is small cell lung cancer. Of those patients, about 20% of patients with small cell lung cancer can present with SIDH. And, and I'm sure many of you see these patients frequently. There are, however, a large number of other uh, tumors. I talked about the olfactory neuroblastomas, for example, <coughs> that generate um, uh, SI vasopressin and can cause SIDH. Remember that there can be transitory syn uh, syndromes. I'm not sure if we should really consider this SIDH, uh, but there are other non-osmotic stimuli that can occur. Uh, one of them, of course, is endurance exercise. We'll talk about uh, exercise associated with hyponatremia in a case later on today. Um, there are uh, hereditary forms of, of a nephrogenic SIDH, where you have a, a gain of function in the, in the uh, vasopressin receptor, the V2 receptor, uh, in children that, that have, and also in adults, by the way where they have a low circulating vasopressin, but they have, for all intents and purposes, SIDH. This is probably the world's worst clinical acronym, NSIAD, um, and that was brought up in the initial case reports in the New England Journal. Why did you almost call this NSAID uh, when, you when you made this uh, acronym? But I digress. There are also drugs that play a big role in, in SIDH. My approach really when I see a consult in, in somebody with hyponatremia, anything to me that is CNS active is a culprit until proven otherwise, and then I'll go look on PubMed or just remember from experience the yes indeed, for example, uh, nicotine is a cause of, vasopress uh, of SIDH uh, as a drug. Pulmonary disorders are very important as are CNS disorders as you all know. When the vasopressin receptor assay, vasopressin assay came out in the, in the uh, I think, 70s and 80s, uh, David Robertson and many other people did uh, a lot of studies of the pattern of SIDH, the pattern of vasopressin release in, in, in forms of uh, SIDH. Many patients will have an unregulated erratic form where there doesn't seem to be any correlation with, with uh, circulating osmolality. Another form will have a baseline increase, this form here, and then they have a normal osmotic response. 
Other patients in turn will have a reset osmostat where it's shifted to the left, as I mentioned. And then there's about a 10% group uh, that have, uh, never have any circulating vasopressin that's measurable. This group includes those patients with nephrogenic SIDH who have activating mutations in the V2 receptor. However, I can tell you that there are other patients that also have this subset. There's a thought that other vasopressin-like hormones can, can turn on water reabsorption, oxytocin being one of the major ones. So question number two. A 19-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department with altered mental status. She'd been at a rave, became drowsy at 2 a.m. and vomited several times. At 4 a.m., she had a generalized seizure that lasted 15 seconds. On exam, she's unresponsive. She's now ventilated. Heart sounds are normal. She does have, however, inspiratory crackles on chest exam. Head and neck is within normal limits with no evidence of trauma. Her, urine, her serum sodium is 120 with an osmolality of 242. Uric acid is 3.7. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this syndrome? So of course it's ecstasy or, or more frequently now maybe molly or other forms of MDMA. So I think of MDMA or ecstasy as SIDH in a pill. Uh, these are normal volunteers who were given a single dose <coughs> of ecstasy, and you can see obviously a vasopressin level of 10 is pretty impressive within a matter of hours of ingesting a single dose of, of ecstasy. So this is due to a combination of factors. You get this acute massive increase in, in AVP, one of the most potent activators of the, the osmoreceptive neurons is serotonin. And, and that's what ecstasy does. It increases the amount of serotonin. And it's also why SSRIs, for example, uh, cause hyponatremia. There's also an acute stimulation of thirst. Uh, serotonin, as I said, activates central osmoreceptors. And there have been case reports where these people are clearly thirsty. A concomitant con confusing factor had been when, when ecstasy was used at raves where people are dancing away, they're often told to make sure you drink a lot of water and, and you, don't become, you don't get rhabdo, which is one of the other uh, consequences of ecstasy. But this segues into the, the causes of acute hyponatremia, which we tend to forget as a separate differential diagnosis. But I think it's really critical that we think of these patients, because these are the patients you get called about at 2 o'clock in the morning. And these are the patients that, that can revolve around lawsuits and, and have a lot of uh, consequences. So iatrogenic, the classic is post-operative uh, hyponatremia in premenopausal women who have, say, ovarian surgery, had the stress of the surgery with an increase in vasopressin, are then given hypotonic fluids and develop acute hyponatremia. But really, any case where you have an elevated vasopressin level and you're giving hypo hypotonic fluids can give you acute hyponatremia. The glycine irrigants in TERPS and uterine surgery, they're classically thought to be normal tonic hyponatremia, but in fact, they're often hypotonic. Uh, one of the causes is colonoscopy preps. Every form of colonoscopy prep has been uh, implicated in the literature with acute hyponatremia. Any, you can develop acute hyponatremia within 24 hours of starting a thiazide, so think of that as well. Uh, polydipsia, this is an unusual cause of, of acute hyponatremia. You may remember, it's almost probably a decade ago now, the We for a We contest in, in somewhere in, I think, the Midwest, where uh, it was a radio contest and people were challenged to drink, free wa drink water and not pee. Uh, and if the, the, peop the person that drank the most uh, would get a Wii, a Nintendo Wii, uh, unfortunately, the, per the contestant that drank the most ended up developing acute hyponatremia and dying at home, uh, e even though pay people were phoning in and saying, you know, this is really quite a stupid thing, what you're doing here. Uh, but it's pretty hard to, gener to drink that much free water that you overwhelm the ability to excrete free water. And it's these unusual cases, the, the frat party where people are drinking from a fire hose and things like that. Ecstasy ingestion we talked about. We're going to talk about a case of exercise-induced 
hyponatremia. Many of these patients will be multifactorial. For example, somebody that's on a thiazide, we think that hypokalemia and thiazide-associated hyponatremia plays a big role, and hypokalemia is a major stimulus for thirst, so many of those patients are polydipsic as well. <clears throat> The symptoms of, of acute hyponatremic encephalopathy, we're taught that these can have early, advanced, and far advanced, but really you can go from very early to death very quickly. So those who have early symptoms, headache, nausea, and vomiting are almost universal in people with acute hyponatremia. Later on, you can get uh, coning, you can get a, a blown pupil, uh, you can get seizures, respiratory arrest, Patients who have had acute hyponatremia can have a central DI afterwards or a central uh, diabetes mellitus, actually. One of the really important issues with acute hyponatremia is the massive preponderance of, of females with acute hyponatremic brain injury. If you look at all hyponatremic controls, there's no increase, uh, there's not thought to be a huge increase in the, in the susceptibility to hyponatremia in women, but they are thought to be much more susceptible to acute hyponatremic brain injury, and there are many different theories for that. The other important issue is to think of the fact that with acute hyponatremia, you can become hypoxic. Uh, through two major mechanisms. One is a hypercapnic respiratory acidosis, and the other is a neurogenic pulmonary edema. And so this is a chest x-ray of a patient with, uh, this was a marathon runner with acute exercise-associated hyponatremia. When they had profound cerebral edema, they also had pulmonary edema. This is a non uh, non um, cardiogenic form of pulmonary edema. Some of these patients have undergone right heart cath and been shown to have normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. When you resolve the hyponatremia, the, hy the, the pulmonary edema goes away. This is a fat fatality. This is a case of a patient uh, that was discussed from LA where the patient had floored pulmonary edema from ecstasy-associated hyponatremia. If we change gears, though, to talk about chronic hyponatremia for reasons that we'll talk about, the, this, the, the, the uh, distinction really evolves around a, being less than 48, greater than 48 hours, because that's the time that it takes for the brain to accommodate to hyponatremia. <clears throat> and this CNS response to hyponatremia that we'll talk about a little bit induces the sensitivity to the correction rate with response to osmotic demyelination syndrome. The symptoms are classically taught as absent, but may include nausea and vomiting, muscle cramps and weakness, ataxia, confusion and change in mental status, and seizures uh, if sodium is very low. So there, I think because of the concern about osmotic demyelination that we'll talk about, there's a whole generation or several generations of med students that were taught that in chronic hyponatremia, there really are no symptoms. There are, however, symptoms in chronic hyponatremia. In terms of what happens if you develop hypo a hypotonic state, if you develop hyponatremia, you have a water gain and low osmolality. That causes a rapid adaptation in the brain. There's a rapid regulatory volume decrease where you lose sodium and potassium and chloride from the intracellular space, but also from the brain space in general. Uh, there then is a slower adaptation where you lose organic osmolites within the brain. The problem is that there's an asymmetry in this. It's very quick. The response to lose organic osmolites <coughs> is much quicker than the, than the response in regaining osmolites once we or, or correct hyponatremia and develop a normal osmolality. This is what you don't want to have happen, which is central pontine myelinolysis from osmotic demyelination syndrome. The vast majority of these patients will have a, a central pontine myelinolysis, but it's not obligatory. Many of these patients will have central pontine myelinolysis with other neurological syndromes, such as, say, a Parkinsonian symptom, symptoms due to basal ganglia disorder. But the pons is one area of the brain where that, that response to increase osmolar, osmolar uh, content in response to resumption of normal osmolality, where that response is actually quite attenuated. <clears throat> 
So the risk factors include the rate of correction, although unfortunately this can occur even when we, when we uh, as correct sodium at accepted rates. Hypokalemia is a big predisposing factor to osmotic demyelination, even uh, accounting for the fact that that can, include, can cause uh, the hyponatremia in and of itself. Alcoholism, malnutrition, liver failure. Uh, in liver disease and liver transplantation, where you rapidly correct the liver disorder, you can get osmotic demyelination. Many of the same osmolar, uh, um, non-osmolar, sorry, non-organic uh, osmolite changes occur in the brain in, in cirrhosis as well as in hyponatremia. This has always been a disorder that seemed quite uh, mysterious to me. We're getting a better idea of what causes osmotic demyelination now. There's a disruption of the blood-brain barrier, so they're leaking of antibodies, complement, and cytokines into perivascular brain. There's a delayed induction of osmolite transporters after correction of hyponatremia, and that can cause decreased osmoregulatory capacity and cell swelling or death. There's some thought that there may be apoptotic or excitotoxic uh, cell death after correction of hyponatremia as well. <clears throat> the classic papers on this came from Rick Stearns over the years. One of his papers was um, uh, a mail-in survey of nephrologists looking at the rate of uh, the uh, preponderance of uh, chronic neurological damage in patients with chronic hyponatremia that had been rapidly corrected compared to those that had acute hyponatremia and been rapidly corrected. One of the key take-home uh, issues, though, is we're taught that you should, as I'll show, you should, uh, shouldn't correct the sodium by greater than 12, 12 points in 24 hours or 18 in 24, um, in 48, sorry. Those really are, there's no guarantee that you're going to avoid osmotic demyelination if you, if you stay below those correction rates. So many authors, uh, such as Rick Stearns and myself included, we advocate very slow correction rates um, to, to avoid osmotic demyelination. And some of the people, say with beer potomania, who are at higher risk of osmotic demyelination. An important paper also came out in the mid-2000s from uh, the Netherlands, a case control series of 122 consecutive asymptomatic hyponatremic patients. Their sodium ranged from 115 to 135, and they had a very high prevalence of falls, and that fall was often the reason for admission. When they took a subset of patients and let them become uh, unitremic or let them become hyponatremic again, uh, they did uh, neuropsych testing, and they found subtle attention and gait de deficits in these patients. And there really wasn't a threshold at which you saw falls in terms of serum sodium. This has also uh, fallen out of other case series. So for example, a large series of thiazide-associated hyponatremia. Uh, the symptoms included many of the things that you would expect, but also 70% of these patients had falls. The other issue that came out is that uh, the risk of fracture is increased in, patient, in elderly patients with mild hyponatremia. We tended to attribute this to the fall risk and the neurological consequences of chronic hyponatremia. But in fact, there are also bony changes that go along with chronic hyponatremia. If you take animals and, and generate a model of SIDH where you give them DDAVP and free water, that's actually a very potent model for osteoporosis, and these animals become quite profoundly osteoporotic. And if you look at, at registries of patients with hyponatremia where they also have bone density measurements, there is a correlation with hyponatremia and low bone density. In terms of the treatment of hyponatremia, we'll talk a little bit about the management of acute symptomatic hyponatremia. In chronic hyponatremia, fluid restriction is a mainstay, but because of the fact that thirst is also activated, that can, that can often be ineffective in these patients. I use Lasix and salt tablets, so Lasix BID will uh, inhibit the countercurrent mechanism quite nicely. Uh, when you give them salt tablets as well, you avoid hypovolemia but you also give them an extra solute that increases free water excretion. 
Some people will also give just salt tablets and that can also be effective because it's an increased solute excretion that will drive water excretion. Uh, Demeclocycline is still available. Um, it's a principal tubule toxin. It also causes AKI, so you should be aware of that, particularly in patients with liver disease. And vasopressin antagonists are another uh, alternative. In terms of treatment of hyponatremia, you need to understand that treatment of this can be uh, life-saving. This is one of these things at 2 o'clock in the morning where you can really make a huge change uh, in mortality. And that management should include hypertonic saline. You should do an, a blood gas. You should look for evidence of, of neurogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, you should give supplemental oxygen because the, the potential for acute hyponatremic brain damage is potentially dramatically if patients are hypo, uh, hypoxic. And many people will say give a loop diuretic in large part to persuade people on the other end of the phone that yes, this patient with pulmonary edema and a low uh, serum sodium does need hypertonic saline even though they're in pulmonary edema. One of the interesting issues is, and we know this from other patients with neurogenic pulmonary edema or uh, increases in cerebral edema, you only need a small increase in serum sodium of maybe four to six points to get these people out of danger. These are pa patients from a Marine Corps marathon and they had point of care sodium and point of care 3% th uh, saline and their symptoms resolve even before they normalize their serum sodium. So you don't need to really increase serum sodium by much to get people out of danger. The corollary to that is if you have a patient that comes in with hyponatremia and you're worried about whether it's symptomatic, if their sodium is already corrected by six to eight points, by the time you see them, you can be reassured to some degree that they're already protected from acute hyponatremic consequences. So the rate of correction, we talked about an acute, maybe one to two milliequivalents per hour, you only need to correct by four to six points to get them out of danger. And this close attention to oxygenation maybe give them furosemide. For chronic hyponatremia, it's less than 10 milliequivalents in the first 24 hours and less than 18 in the first uh, 48. And some advocate a much more conservative approach. I'll give you a reference uh, for a PDF that I have of an entire issue of seminars in nephrology where Rick Stearns had a, had a nice description of why he thinks we should do much lower rates of correction. In terms of how we predict these corrections, there are many qual uh, quantitative formulas. The electrolyte-free water clearance is more important probably in hypernatremic patients where we want to calculate how much free water they're losing on a daily basis. There's the Medeas formula in relationship to serum soda, uh, the uh, sodium infused. And then there's a urine plasma electrolyte ratio, which is sort of a spot uh, electrolyte free water excretion in, that can help you help um, uh, decide how much free water restriction to utilize. There are much more complicated uh, versions of these formulae. Uh, if you're up in the middle of the night, this is a terrific reference in terms of SIDH from the New England Journal. There are, however, major caveats with these formulae. And as I mentioned, in the typical hyponatremic patient, the, the physiology is not static the minute, the minute you start doing things to them. So, these, so these, none of these uh, equations tell you what's going to happen once you start changing the physiology. And this was shown very nicely by the group in Rochester. They looked at the actual rate in sodium versus the predicted rate in sodium, and patients could have a five times higher actual rate in, uh, increase in sodium than was predicted by the formulae. So what do you do? What do I do if I'm uh, uh, confronted by a patient that I want to give hypertonic saline? I will use the uh, sodium deficit formula to, to, cor to calculate how much hypertonic saline to give. And then I usually will lowball that a little bit and start treating the patient. There are other ways of doing it. Some people advocate giving a single bolus of 100 mLs of hypertonic saline. That's often what's advocated at some marathons, for example. What do you do if you overcorrect? Well, you can give DDAVP and D5W to reinduce hyponatremia. There's good animal and human data for this. Myonositol supplementation during correction can avoid this, this problem in rats, at least, but it's not something available in humans. 
There's some animal data that if you give dexamethasone and restore the blood-brain barrier, you're less likely to develop osmotic demyelination. There's no human data to that effect. But there was a very, very uh, influential pay -to -pay, again, paper again by Rick Stearns back in 2008 that showed that it is safe in these patients to reinduce hyponatremia to either re to, or to slow the rate of correction by giving DDAVP. The problem is you get this herky-jerky up and down that tends to annoy the ICU staff that you're dealing with where you reinduce hyponatremia and this can be quite prolonged actually as they're sitting there in the ICU. Rick and his group came up with a different form of correcting hyponatremia where they would clamp vasopressin by giving large amounts of DDAVP and then they would fill the beaker with hypertonic saline. This was the case report where they talked about this and they've had a case series of doing this in multiple patients and it seems to be relatively safe. Uh, I've done this myself a few times, but it's really dependent on us getting in when the sodium is actually low at the beginning. So question number three, this is a 40-year-old woman with flu-like illness and profuse diarrhea. She's already received a liter and a half of saline in the, in the uh, ER. This is a case that I got from Moonlighting. Uh, the serum sodium on admission was 121 with a urine sodium of 12. By the time I saw her, her urine sodium had come up to 18 and her urine osmolality had come down a little bit and she was starting to have a water diuresis. So what would the, uh, uh, which of these following therapies is the most appropriate? Any takers? So in my mind, it's really uh, giving free water, giving back DDAVP. So again, this is this idea of reinducing uh, re hyponatremia or in people that are on their way to overcorrecting, giving them uh, DDAVP. And then the third really important differential uh, in hyponatremia is what are the causes of hyponatremia that can be associated <coughs> with overcorrection? What I've started doing is, when I see these patients, I'll say, you did nothing wrong here. This was entirely predictable. This happens, and we'll deal with it. Um, hypovolemic hyponatremia is classic. Once you start to give saline, vasopressin uh, immediately goes away. The half-life of vasopressin is only something like 10 to 15 minutes. So you immediately, by giving saline, you can immediately shut it off. Hypopit patients with secondary adrenal failure because uh, glucocorticoids inhibit vasopressin secretion, they'll have what looks like SIDH. Thiazide associated hyponatremia or rapid spontaneous resolution of SIDH, discontinuation of DDAVP, and as I mentioned before, uh, low solute hyponatremia is also on this differential. So these are patients that were given glucocorticoids for hypopit associated hyponatremia. And this is their uh, vasopressin before and after being given glucocorticoids. And you can see how their va vasopressin plummets. We had a case that we discussed in, in these, this case series that you can get from me, where the patient was given, DD, uh, given uh, dexamethasone, uh, hydrocortisone, sorry, and had a massive overcorrection in, in serum sodium over that period of time. Vasopressin antagonists, there's really uh, only two that are available, have been approved, uh, conovaptan and tolvaptan. Just be aware of the FDA advisory for tolvaptan. Uh, there's a, an increase in liver function test that was uh, determined in the Tempo PKD trial. So you're told not to give it for more than 30 days and to not give it anymore in liver patients. So these drugs work. The SALT trials for tolvaptin were uh, published 10 years ago. Uh, conovaptin uh, uh, is not approved for cirrhosis or acute hyponatremia or for primary treatment of heart failure. And neither of these drugs is appropriate for acute treatment of hyponatremia, where the goal is to increase the serum osmolality by that four to six points to get people out of danger. And again, these drugs have a risk of a rapid correction. It's probably 10% with the vasopressin antagonist, the risk of overcorrection. And there has now been a case report where somebody developed osmotic demyelination after being given a Vaptan. These patients need to be given a lot of free water. So when you do give a Tolvaptan, they need to take at least two liters a day of free water to avoid an overcorrection. 
So the pros and cons, well, I'm not really sure what the indications are in clinical practice. There's a significant expense. Tolvaptin is still about $200 a day. This risk of overcorrection we talked about, the liver metab um, FDA advisory for the liver uh, toxicity of tolvaptin. And colvaptin is really IV but not oral. Tolvaptin is oral but not IV. In the last five minutes or so, we'll talk about hypernatremia. We have some cases that we'll talk about in a bit more detail uh, at, at later on. Here, how, you, how do you develop hypernatremia? Well, you either increase the numerator, which is very rare, but can be seen in various forms of salt poisoning, or you decrease the denominator by reducing total body water. Water intake disorders, insufficient water intake is very common. High sodium intake without adequate uh, water, as I mentioned, is rare. There are very rare thirst or osmoreceptor uh, CNS lesions that cause hypernatremia. These are rare because you really have to ablate multiple centers of the hypothalamus to develop uh, a complete loss in osmoreceptor function. These can occur, however, with infiltrating CNS tumors. You can see it with sarcoid. We've had several cases uh, that we've discussed at the Brigham with sarcoid-associated uh, hypernatremia. A stroke, primary hyperaldosterone. In elderly patients, you also see some degree of an osmoreceptor defect. You can get hypernatremia in inappropriately high water loss, be that insensible losses or gastrointestinal losses. Be aware that secretory diarrheas are usually pretty isotonic, whereas osmotic diarrhea, uh, diarrheas will have free water loss associated with them in hypernatremia. Or you can have renal loss of free water uh, due to diabetes insipidus. This may be a decreased AVP secretion in central DI. Degradation of vasopressin and, and gestational DI, where you have a vasopressinase that's secreted over, over secreted by the placenta because it's secreted in normal pregnancies. Uh, renal AVP resistance in, in nephrogenic DI. The causes of CNS, uh, central DI are multiple. Uh, we mentioned some of them, like uh, sarcoid as well can give you, uh, grand, uh, sarcoid can give you uh, central DI from this. We're taught that there's this sort of classic pattern of polyuria and then hyponatremia after pituitary surgery, but I wanted to underline that this is not really the case. You don't normally have this uh, triphasic response. More commonly, you have either postoperative polyuria or prolonged or an isolated delayed hyponatremia after pituitary surgery. What do we do for patients that have polyuria greater than three liters a day? If the osmolar excretion rate is greater than 1,000, that's an osmotic diuresis. If it's less than that, it's a water diuresis, and then we look at the serum sodium. If it's less than 140, these are most likely polydipsic patients. If it, they're hypernatremic, they're more likely to have a bona fide diabetes insipidus. Causes of nephrogenic DI are a multiple. Really, the most common one, of course, is lithium, and we'll talk about that in a case later today. Uh, hypercalcemia through the calcium sensing receptor can, can inhibit the, con the concentrating mechanism and also can inhibit uh, principal cells. Hypokalemia is an important cause of nephrogenic di diabetes. You can see X-linked forms, the vasopressin receptor mutations uh, you may see on an exam. There are also acroporin-2 and acroporin-1 mutations that can occur. The other important uh, disorder where you see this is really in resolving acute tubular necrosis. And I'm sure many of you will appreciate that as patients recover from ATN, you will often see, you know, day six or seven, that they start to have a slight hypernatremia because of that post-ATN uh, nephrogenic DI. Gestational DI is very rare. Uh, you have an increased expression, release, or activity of a vasopressinase that's produced by the placenta. It may occur in the context of preeclampsia and or acute fatty liver or pregnancy. And DDAVP is the treatment because it's resistant to this vasopressinase and hence effective. Water deprivation testing is really helpful in patients with, with uh, diabetes insipidus. We're looking after giving vasopressin if they have a central DI or a partial DI. And we'll talk about how you do a water deprivation test when we go through that in a case later today. The treatment of hypernatremia is to restore the water deficit. 
and also to reduce and or replace ongoing losses of hypotonic fluids. This becomes very important in patients, for example, with nephrogenic DI from lithium, where people will often replete the free water deficit but forget that there's an ongoing free water loss. And then treat the, central, the, the underlying cause. Do they need DDAVP? Should you give hydrochlorothiazide or an NSAID in nephrogenic DI? I think very rarely. And we talked about this rare form gestational DI where you can give DDAVP. You need to calculate the free water deficit as described, and you can also use the urine electrolyte free water ex excretion as an index of how much free water is being lost per day. So the take home message is the role of central osmoreceptors in hypo hyponatremia, the differential diagnosis of acute hyponatremia and hyponatremia prone to correction, overcorrection. These are important differential diagnoses, I think, that we don't talk about enough. The role of DDAVP and D5W in patients who overcorrect. This idea of a DDAVP clamp with hypertonic saline to provide controlled correction in hyponatremia. And the electrolyte free water clearance in hyponatremia to estimate ongoing loss. So it's still actually a pretty good timely addition. We had a, 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 an addition of the seminars in nephrology now several years ago that goes through everything you needed to know about hyponatremia but didn't care to ask. Uh, if you email me, I'll send you that. Uh, then, of course, some of the Rick Stern's papers that we talked about and also my, my Harrison's chapter. Any questions? So the question is, if you take away the fact that the woman is pregnant, how can you tell gestational DI from central DI? That actually turns out to be a much more tricky question than you would think. Um, if you actually measure, if anybody has measured vasopressin in pregnant patients, um, there's a problem because the vasopressinase, if you look in the literature, that vasopressin activity goes up dramatically in the, in the third trimester. So normal pregnant patients will have vasopressinase in their, in their plasma. And it's really an o, a, it's a matter of degree as to when you get gestational DI. So measuring vasopressin, there, are, um, there is an inhibitor that you can add, uh, but how do you add that to the sample? And then there's some suggestion that this inhibitor of vasopressinase can actually affect the radioamino assays. So when it really gets down to brass tacks of how you diagnose gestational DI, it's not easy to do. Um, and both central DI and gestational DI will respond to uh, DDAVP. So uh, in my view, unless you give the, the inhibitor, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the inhibitor, maybe uh, Alan remembers. No, it's, it's an inhibitor of the vasopressinase. Um, if you give that, if, unless you do the assay very clearly, and there are case reports where they show that if you give vasopressin, it goes away, so that there is excessive activity of the vasopressinase. Often what you end up doing is having to wait until the patient is postpartum to make the diagnosis of clearly being, uh, having central DI. Um, and so I, I tend to advocate, we had a patient recently presenting to the Brigham who has a severe lithium-associated nephrogenic DI, and she gets tremendous troubles during her pregnancy. And they had made this diagnosis of associated gestational DI, and it just, unless you do that assay correctly, it's very hard to prove. 